anyhow. We're going to talk about uh, uh, type functional programming languages and uh, their power, uh, which I hope uh, to find interesting and uh, useful in uh, your future programming. Uh, so you, you can do it uh, with more power and better, <laughs> basically, yeah, I think. So uh, go for Michal. Thank you, Richard, and thank you all for taking time to listen to, to this talk. Uh, so I feel a little bit kind of nervous because I've never given a talk like that in front of experienced people, people who have a hundred times more experience than I in programming. But uh, just a little bit about myself, uh, so I'm a lecturer at Austin University and I teach various subjects in computer science and I work only very briefly in industry, not really on any project where I could say I've done this big thing that you can look at, um, like probably you can. And, uh, but as part of what I do at the university, sometimes I need to program as part of my research or some administrative job that really has to be automated or some system uses to provide it. So, so when I do those programming tasks, I usually choose a functional programming language because that's what I've been doing for the last 10 years or so, or more actually. And today I will be sort of sharing my views on, on, on this and trying to make it relevant to hopefully what, where you're at. So please be as interactive as you want to be with me. I'm very happy with that. The more, the better in a way. Because then I know what's useful or not maybe to you. So just before I get in, uh, I'm not trying to explain these little snippets of code. Just uh, if you can see them well enough, uh, I want to ask you whether you can guess which languages they're written. So first the test, can you see well enough? Can you guess what this is? What language is Java. 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 So you can see well enough. How about this one? Anybody seen that other language before? So, so this snippet does exactly what this Java code does, but it's a functional language. So Haskell. Exactly, yes. So this is, this is Haskell, one of the functional <coughs> languages that I will be you know, using in this talk. I think technically that first one might be groovy. This one? Yeah, because well, it's see. missing a semicolon. Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, where, where is this? Oh, here. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, Nick, I was going to back in five minutes. It's taken it's from the project. Yeah. Because it's like uh, I borrowed fast, this code yeah. from Adam, who is a uh, yes, you know, good yes, friend and good colleague. And he had it in his similar kind of slides, and I just copied it. But it was an image, so I had to type it by hand. <laughs> so I, said, I did it about two hours ago. So. Um, and the last one, anybody can guess what language that is? Example. Yes. Example. So that's another example of a functional language, which uh, everybody knows probably. Unlike Haskell. Um, right. <coughs> so let me just spend a few moments uh, kind of trying to find out what you think about functional programming, what you think it is, um, and where it comes from. So, first of all, uh, let's start straight uh, with some introduction. Uh, has anybody got some ideas of what functional programming could be about? What defines that paradigm as opposed to another paradigm, such as object-oriented or classical procedural programming, the style of A does C? Mutual say. Immutable state. Immutable state, thank you. That's pretty good. Uh, this does work almost. Yes. Immutable? Oh, sorry, immutable. Yeah. That's totally true. <coughs> thank you. I did it on purpose. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Based on functions. Hmm? Based on functions for all okay. the objects. Evaluating functions. Evaluating. Based, on evaluating. Yes. Based on evaluating functions. That's perfect. There's all sorts of things that are called functions in the programming world, sometimes not in the same sense as a function. But when you say evaluating functions, in mathematical sense functions. Yes. Yeah. Brilliant. Any other idea? <laughs> yes, it is comic sense. Yeah, it says on the front row. Right. <laughs> yeah, I missed what you said, but. Ah. The front. 
Comedy sound. Oh yes, it is. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Because I'm bottom to probably sound jolly and fun. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, well, that's good that I know what you think, and, and I think you're totally right. These are the most what I would think. Sorry, I'll just do this once, and it should come up again. This is what I think also are the most important attributes that define functional programming. I've put a few more here, not necessarily the most important ones, but sometimes people associate with functional programming. And some of them are actually not necessarily just present in functional programming. So functions is first class data, not only we evaluate them, we can also store them, pass them as parameters and so on, in exactly the same way as we do with any other values. Algebraic data types, uh, it's something that's kind of come from the functional programming world, originally from LISP, I suppose, although they, they're not really data types in LISP, but they, they were in ML and in, in other languages later. Um, the example, by the way, put just little snippets to put some concrete thing to look at as opposed to just these terms, so we know we're looking, we're talking about the same thing. And these are all from Scala, because I understood that from Richard that some of you have worked with Scala. Just a quick survey, who has? Okay, most people. Good. That's good. So I can put <coughs> some things quicker. That's great. So I don't have to explain so much about the concepts and the syntax of Scala. So I'll try to stick to Scala as much as I can, although I myself have not done anything serious in Scala. I've learned it in the last week or so for the purpose of this talk, which is very fun. It was good fun learning the Scala. Um, but you, you may be able to correct me or find some better way of doing it. Please do. Do you see that? Pattern matching is another thing that goes hand in hand with the algebraic data types. So if we do have them, then we probably want to pattern match on them as well to make sometimes sometimes code code quicker. And that's also associated often with functional programming. Also, it's also in logic programming and a few other uh, languages. Immutable data we already said, so it's clear. Static programming um, kind of is related to the immutable data. So we we, we prefer in functional languages to to write down what it is that we want to compute in some very transparent way as opposed to as a result of a complex algorithm. Although it can be also complex, obviously, because complex things can't be simplified just for free. Support for lazy evaluation is the last one I want to mention. Um, so that's often associated with functional language, although we also have it in, in other languages. But in functional languages, it's easier because of the presence of the immutable data. Um, and, and the declarative programming. So laziness uh, means that we have an expression that um, somehow comes into context of the, of the execution but is not e evaluated until it's certainly needed as opposed to evaluating kind of inner expressions before we can make sense of the outer expression. So where we don't have to evaluate the inner expression necessarily and still make sense of the outer expression, then we have lazy evaluation. And this is a Scala example. Uh, does everybody understand this a bit? Yeah. yeah. Good, okay. Well, excellent. I only learned <coughs> it last night. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Okay. Is space missing up to you? Is there a space missing? To that's that's, up to that's not required. Yeah. It's probably okay. <coughs> Doesn't it hear a certain style? Really? <laughs> Just to re 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 remind myself more than anybody else that these arrows here indicate that the laziness within these two parameters, which means that what we are defining here is an kind of alternative to the if keyword, which uh, automatically negates the condition for whatever reason. And once we've defined it this way, of course we have to make the two branches of the if lazily evaluated, otherwise we would always evaluate both of them before we actually make sense of the whole if that would be wrong. Uh, but thanks to laziness, we can do that and still work as expected. And this if would be almost replace, you know, almost a drop in replacement for if whenever uh, in, in terms of syntax. Uh, so in other words, we can define new control constructs. The control constructs in the language are not necessarily something special. They're just examples of normal values you get in the language. Okay? So that makes such languages maybe simpler because there are less special things in them. Everything is an instance of the same concept. I copied this from another uh, uh, paper by by the author of Miranda. And these are the kind of some of the most important milestones in the history of of, of, of functional programming. Just to remind ourselves that this is actually stretching 
far back. It's not something that came recently, although recently maybe it's been more seen in the, in the industrial world than, than, than in the 1970s or 1980s, but it actually stretches back to before, before the era of computers, because people are playing with uh, a similar kind of calculus as, as, as we see in, in say, Haskell, the, the lambda calculus in, in the 1930s. Um, mainly as a, as a mathematical toy rather than as, a, as something to, to do something useful with. Um, has anybody got an interesting story about any of these? Or? <laughs> so this is an interesting thing to, to know how old we are. So I straight somewhere, somewhere, somewhere here probably. I heard about Miranda before this talk, or before I had to prepare for this talk, or before I was interested in functional programming per se. But all those things, and of course I listed at list the university. And on the calculus of the maths, but the other things here mean nothing to me. I never heard about them until now. Um, so do they mean anything to anybody here? Has anybody met any of these languages? Okay, mm -hmm. Wales, relatively young. ML. Oh, ML, of course, ML, yes. But not already ML, yeah. 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 I was at Warwick and they had uh, Waffle, which I think was Warwick functional language, and Piffle, which is a poorly implemented functional language. <laughs> Purely. Poorly implemented. Poorly implemented. <laughs> sounds, sounds fun. Yeah. Uh, there was another one called Linda that is based on Miranda. Which one? Linda. Lin Linda. Yes, yes. I mean, I, this is not a complete list. These are some of the more important ones. There are hundreds of languages and even hundreds of functional languages around. Okay. So now what I want to do next is kind of think about what people say, good and bad things about functional programming. This is one of the earliest quotes about functional programming from an important person. Give you a minute to read it. come from someone who is really expert in, in infrared programming and they appreciate the expression bits if they are pure, that is, um, <laughs> without side effects. Then. It's kind of ironic that uh, Bacchus had that view of the world and then created Fortran, the most side effective language known to mankind. <laughs> <laughs> I can't remember whether it was before or after. Yeah, <laughs> it's going to be after Fortran, because yes. Fortran 66. Mm. Yes, that must be after the yes, first exactly. He, he realised the horror of what he created. <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, so, okay, I've got a list of good things and a list of bad things, but I haven't, I'm not showing them just yet. Do you want to throw your own in still? That you can't do I.O. properly. Can't do I.O. properly? Yes. We think, okay. Anything else? Another bad is that the tool support for functional languages generally likes imperative or other languages. Uh, okay. So, Good because of the immutability, uh, it's very good at uh, multi-threading. Yes. A multi-process. Mm -hmm. I will touch on that later with a concrete example. Because of lambda like calculus, this. you can find out correctness of. Because of lambda calculus, you can find the correctness of the program algorithm much easier. Oh, you can establish correctness. Yes. yes. Thank you. I think you can do it in procedural, but. Not always, not in such a simple way. Uh -huh. maybe, maybe I have nothing to say to you guys, you already know what we're <laughs> about functional programming. But anyway, I'll maybe show you now the list, unless there's something else. Or maybe you can tell me something that's missing on that list. So I'll show you some of the things about the I.O. It's not mentioned here, so I haven't heard that before. So I, didn't. So I don't agree necessarily with all these points, it's just what I hear people say. And I hope some of this will come through as, as correct or, or wrong through this talk, or, or you'll be done. 
involve your understanding of this world could evolve through some of the examples we'll see. Um, anything you want to comment on? Or is it all? So there's a tension between maintaining your code and hard to learn and hard to express. Uh -huh. uh, um, so right. you, you could argue that if it's hard to express what you're doing, then mm -hmm. your code potentially is less maintainable. Or code well, too, com too complicated, hard to read, is sort of the opposite yeah. of maintainable code. Mm. So this I'm, is I'm not saying I necessarily disagree mm -hmm. or agree, but so this is this is a relative thing. Obviously, it depends on one's style of thinking and how long has been yeah. one has been used to working with functional programming. So if one has done it for many years, then probably they'll find it relatively easy. Which in turn is li linked to no critical mass, isn't it? I think that's a, that's a link to the critical mass statement. Yeah. 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 Yeah, so maybe that will change, but I still think it's true. Let's not stop. <laughs> Let's get everybody from the street. <laughs> um, They're very memory consuming as well. It could be. So, yes, uh, that's interesting. Yes, uh, I'll put it on this list. Um, there was a guy who tried to make a Pac Man using functional programming language. He described all his pain trying to do a Pac-Man, Pac-Man Pac game. Pac -Man. Oh, ba okay. In functional language. When? I don't know. Recently. Okay. You tried to. No, no, some guy. I mean, okay. Right. So one one of the issues it's sort of related to the I/O issue is um, <coughs> as you express everything in functions and you want your functions to be self-contained, if they need to do some I/O for to, to handle what they're doing, say for example the database read, you can define that in your function and then you compose lots of different functions and you do them in loops and all this comprehension and you end up with a very inefficient system because it's going to, to the database a lot more frequently than perhaps if you were <coughs> writing it in a procedural fashion where you think actually I'll, I need to go load the data first and then process it. One of the problems this guy had was uh, creating the output uh, which had a little changes and yet get created from scratch almost every time. That's first thing. The second thing was keeping the state. Yeah. Where stuff on a screen and uh, passing them again and again and again in the functions in the loop, which is the so function which, function which, function. which language? Do you know which language yeah. they used? So some of these <coughs> points stem from probably facts that um, it can be good or bad that, that uh, functional languages put a lot of constraints on what can be done and how it should be done. And uh, as a result, it could be perceived as hard to learn, hard to work with, uh, too complicated. But uh, as a consequence of the same fact, it could be easier to modularize because the code is of a better quality or, or easy, easier to maintain because it's enforcing a lot of explicit things that would be hidden otherwise uh, made explicit in, in this stuff. Okay, so let's, let's, let's leave that alone and now let's look at concrete code examples. So this is probably no news to you, but let's just quickly look at them. Uh, for example, how do we work with lists in Java and how do we work with lists in Scala and Haskell? It's a very simple operation. We create a list and we create another list that's a that list. In other words, creating a, a, another list that's those elements are corresponding one to one to the elements of the original list, but the certain operation applied in order to derive the new element. Okay? Actually I didn't know before this talk I can do it so concisely in Java, I thought it was worse, but this is not too bad. Uh, but you can do it even more concisely using list comprehensions in, in Scala or Haskell. Okay. Is it clear? Okay. So what's, what's bad about the Java version, although it's fairly short and clear? Uh, it's bad. The bad thing is that in creating the second list, we make it explicit how we create a second list in what order, and um, and we have to have this explicit state through through the for loop here. Because although it looks like for loop here as well, and it can be used as a for loop, it shouldn't be seen if it's pure as a for loop. Like in the Haskell notation is probably better here because it reminds us of the mathematical notation for sets, and that's what it's supposed to mean, as opposed to doing something step by step. Whereas the Java version obviously is doing something step by step, and we, we can see that at some point in the middle of this operation, this two doesn't have as yet all the elements, only has half or, or one, one, 
two or three of those four elements in. And uh, if we get something wrong in that in that context, then we, for example, if we instead of adding to list two, which we should, we add to list one, it will create all sorts of trouble, right? And the type system doesn't help. Um, and it's easy to make a mistake because of this unnecessary state that, that we have in there. Um, and there's obviously a lot of type annotations that Java requires us to do. And one nice thing about functional languages is that they, thanks to these restrictions they, they put on what you can write, it's easier to do type inference. Um, so for example, in the Scala version, we didn't have to write any of these four. Obviously, some of them disappeared because the line is not there at all, but we didn't have to declare the type for the list one and list two variables because or values because it's easy to see from the right hand side what their type is. That there are two things to say about functional programming, and two good things to say that they kind of remove sometimes unnecessary state and they uh, make it easier to derive types when we do want types. That is. Now another example, tree processing. So let's assume that we want to have a type in Java that allows us to express trees, a very simple kind of trees where we could have potentially many children in every node, but we want some numbers and beliefs. Um, so the tree that's constructed at the bottom is the following one. Okay. And again, using this erase as list thing, uh, trick, it's not too bad to create a tree like that, because the list of children can be created fairly concisely. But defining the method sum tree, in Java, we really have to work with the inheritance and the dynamic dispatch and define it in several places separately, which is sometimes the right thing to do. But maybe in this case, I would have found it easier to work with pattern matching as opposed to, and, and have the code in one place as opposed to spread out uh, across the different classes as it is now in Java. So, so Scala and, and Haskell will offer us uh, a more concise and maybe in some aspects better way to do the same. Uh, so in Scala we have these case classes which really correspond to um, nodes of trees with, with, with some explicit children that we quite easily see. It, it, Scala will explo explode that into a proper normal class with a lot of things given for free to us uh, for these classes to, to enable and support the, uh, the pattern matching which we see in this particular snippet here applied to, to do the same operation, summing those numbers in the tree. <coughs> Just show the contrast with, with the clarity of syntax and, um, and, and, uh, and conciseness with Haskell. You have the same here in Haskell. Not exactly the same because we don't give the names for the, chil for the, for the children of each node. For example, the name data and children doesn't appear there. We could have put it there as well. but. I just wanted to make it as quick as, as short as possible and as clear as possible. They're actually not necessary in this case. So thanks to pattern matching, we don't need to use these accessor names. We can pattern match the, the content of the node easily up. Okay, any question about this? Or is it straightforward. So what we're doing here is we're contrasting what we typically do in Java and what we can do in, in a functional language as a, as a, as a benefit, potentially. Again, hardly any types are mentioned here except those that are defined. Uh, type for all the elements are derived and checked. It's not like in Python by, or JavaScript where you can define all sorts of things, but it's only at runtime usually where you see whether it's correct or not in terms of just simple type, type consistency. Find a bit more complicated examples before we go on. To, before I want to go on to a few uh, areas of application. So uh, this is a bit of idiomatic, but not necessarily very nice Java code. Now, I'm curious how you here do thread synchronization when you program in Java. Do you need it at all, actually, or not? Fairly infrequently. We we rely on libraries, you know, like uh, executor service. Yeah, yeah. Okay. But this is still something you sometimes see. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
So what's happening here is that we have we have two threads created by the main thread, one called worker, one monitor. What what they do is defining these two runnable classes, and uh, the worker has a. I must have forgotten something here. I think there's a there's a. This this list this list uh, refers to a field in an outer class. Which I forgot to include. Sorry. So so they all share share the, the what the content they all have access to to what the variable is points to. And uh, and it is some kind of linked list uh, initially with with just two elements say um, and. Maybe it's best to show you how it runs. It's, it's kind of fun because what happens here is that the, the worker either adds an element to the list or removes an element from the list every second at random. It chooses between the two at random. And the monitor simply keeps printing whenever the size of the list changes, the, the, what the new size is. Um, and it's, uh, this relates to a completely different thing in mathematics that has nothing to do with programming, it's just fun. Uh, when you have a random walk on a line, you, with 100% certainty, you'll cover the whole line. So this program will let you terminate with an exception, with 100% certainty. Because when it tries to remove an element from the empty list, when it crosses zero in a way on, on, the, on the line of the length, uh, then it will, it will crash with an exception. So I was kind of playing with it, uh, enjoying how long, how long it will take before it does it. <laughs> but okay, we do like it. Rather, instead, I want to show you a Haskell version which, which um, in Haskell it's very difficult to do something like that, you know, the same logic. It is possible, but that's not what people would normally do. So I will, I'll show you what people will normally do in, in Haskell when they want to program something similar. And this will kind of go back to the point about how difficult it is to do I/O, because with multi-threading you cannot avoid effects, right? When threads talk to each other, that's effect. Um, when you do explicit multi-threading, sometimes you get parallelism for free, especially in functional programming, but that's. That's a different topic I don't want to talk too much about, although it's also interesting. If we do want explicit body threading, we can use something called software transactional memory. So have you encountered that as well? Because that's available in many languages now. And it's originated in Haskell. So I want to see, I want to show you how, first of all, I want to explain how it works in case you're not too familiar, some of you. And, and second, I want to show how the features of Haskell, especially functional programming in Haskell, nicely support this, this, this way of synchronizing threads. Okay, so first of all, I, it may be that because this is quite a big piece of Haskell, maybe that the syntax would be an issue, so I want to help you understand it to a level where we can then talk about the, the important bits in there. Um, so first of all, Haskell uses indentation syntax to, to, to define blocks. So here we have three big blocks. One defines a value called main, one defines a value called worker run, and one defines a value called monitor run. Okay? Because that's in, where the indentation adds. So that's and then you have sub blocks in the within it. Secondly, uh, main by convention in Haskell will always be of a certain type that allows <coughs> the start of the execution of the program. Okay? Um, and when a program executes, it has to have a side effect, otherwise it's useless. Okay? It has to be functional. Sorry? If it has side effect, it's not really functional. Ah, method. yes. So, so uh, Simon Pettin Jones, maybe you've heard about the name. A guy called Simon Pettin Jones is one of the inventors of Haskell, and he's a very good speaker, and, uh, thinker in this field. He said that Haskell is the finest imperative programming language. So, Haskell can do both. Functional programming and imperative programming, and, and obviously here we see some of the imperative aspects that in Haskell. But what I like about Haskell, in particular, most, and that's not in all functional languages, what I like most is that it can cleanly separate effectful imperative code from pure code in such a way that I cannot make a mistake. Um, the type system will actually check for me that I'm not accidentally having a side effect in something that's declared to be pure. And it, and it uh, has got reasonably good syntax in, in, in allowing me to, um, to know which bit is pure and which bit is not pure. And, and as we see in this example, there's more to it still that, that's useful. So I'll, I'll, I'll annotate it further with colors. Imperative code will be in red. Um, 
the kind of imperative bit where I can do anything, where I, when I'm allowed to have any effects whatsoever. I can write the database, I can uh, do network networking, I can do writing to the console, all these things, uh, communicate between threads. And here's another one. And I think that's it in this code. Now, now I use green to indicate what's entirely pure. Um, okay, this is pure. Unfortunately, I commented out most of the pure things because I wanted to focus on the threat synchronization. <laughs> but um, actually, there's another red bit I forgot to show here. Yeah. Basically, each of the threads will have to do something where all effects are allowed in order to um, allow the synchronization to occur. Um, and then I want to use another color orange to show something in between. Um, imperative code where only some effects are allowed. And I'll later show you what effects they are. So this is something imperative, but not entirely free to do anything um, here as well. This bit. Okay, so how does this work? So, first of all, the main program starts with the word do, and that means I'm going to do something that's probably imperative. Okay, I don't want to go into the theory behind you know, the full generality, the fully general explanation, that would be a bit too much for, for this talk, but I'll, I'll just say for now that when you see a do in Haskell, that means we're now going to do a sequence of steps that have effects as opposed to defining a pure value. Um, somebody would say this is the pure value because we're defining a value whose meaning is a, an imperative program. That's how you can see it. Because you can then take this imperative program, store it somewhere, and then maybe sequence it with another as much as you like. But, um, also, it's, it's more honest to say that this is really an imperative program. Because Haskell doesn't just create a value, it will actually execute it. It wouldn't be very useful if it if the output of a Haskell program would be a Java program, then I have to go and compile it and run it somehow in a different environment. So instead, Haskell really executes it as soon as it creates it. And this one has three steps. It creates something called transactional variable, and the name list we will now refer to it within the context of this block. Fork IO is a way to create a thread. Obviously, that's got a side effect, but it takes a, another value as a parameter, um, which is in a imperative program of the same kind as main, right? So when I create a thread, I need to tell you what to do. And in this case, I give it a function of the same type as main that will allow any, you know, which will be like an imperative program to, to execute. And then I let the main thread itself do the worker's job here as opposed to creating a new thread. So I just call directly the, the method, which is similar to the first one for the, for the, for the other thread. Now, how do they define, how do these two functions define uh, what the thread should be doing? Let's look at the monitor first, because this one has got the sequence thing here, which is a bit, okay, let's do that first, but the sequence. So this is interesting. This is where we treat an imperative program as data for a while. So work item is defined here, and it's in red, so it's going to be an imperative program. Repeat is a function that takes anything and creates an infinite list where this same thing is repeated over and over. Okay. So we create an infinite sequence of, of imperative programs. They all do the same thing. And then it's special, it's, it's in special it's it's in the same color as keywords, which is probably a mistake in this in this particular software I use for typesetting the, the code. It shouldn't be because it's just a normal function like any other. Which takes a sequence of imperative programs and actually makes one imperative program out of them, an infinite one. And it, that's the that's that's what the result of this function is when we give it a particular transactional variable, it will it will be an infinite imperative program that's then executed by the thread, so the thread never stops. In Java, we would say while well, true work item. That's probably easy to understand. Okay, but it's fun that you can do that sort of thing as well. Um, now, what is work item? It waits for a second first of all, and then creates a random boolean. Notice there is no mention of boolean here. So, because the should decrease word is used later in a place where boolean is expected, it will derive that this must be boolean and also use random IO to generate a boolean rather than anything else. Okay? And then 
There's this atomically. This is the interesting bit which transfers from red to yellow. Allows us to insert a yellow thing within the red thing. And the yellow thing is where we are doing the transactional business. That's where we are working with shared state in a way that's safe and at the same time avoid locking. How does it do it? Um, it attempts to, to execute this orange program and if it detects a conflict with another thread working with the same state, it will roll back and try again. And to be able to roll back, I have to forbid certain things, a lot of things in fact. I have to forbid almost all I.O. except writing or reading this shared state, which is specially implemented in such a way that it can be rolled back. Okay? But it's still an imperative program because it has this reading and writing of variables, but it's one where I'm forbidden <coughs> all the other things that are not pure except these I meant to mention. Okay. Just to show how easy it is to actually write the function, the pure function that updates the list. Um, so it's based on the value of this boolean, it either drops one element of the list or adds another element. So these are these two values are functions from list to lists. Right? Uh, and we return one or the other based on the boolean. And the modify transaction variable function takes the variable and the function that will update its value and, and, and do that. So it's quite concise thanks to the presence of functions as as, uh, as as no ordinary values can be passed around. Yeah. Now one other interesting aspect here, when we look at the monitor, okay, I left out the logic that just repeats it over and over, uh, and let's focus on the bit that uh, detects the change without having to poll. So we want to avoid polling, right, in this kind of situation, because we don't know how often this thread will change it. Uh, or this, when writing this, this, this code, we shouldn't rely on some property we happen to know, so it's maintainable. So instead, we have to wait for the change in, in, a, in an efficient way. So this, uh, the first thing that monitor size function does, which is something that's repeated over and over in, 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 in by this thread, it, it waits until a change happens, and then also has the new size of the list available when, when it's changed, so they can report what's happened. And this is how the waiting happens. So this do here says we are writing an imperative program but one that has certain effects only. How do we know it's orange rather than red? There's nothing to tell me. Uh, it's derived from the fact that it's used as a parameter to the atomically function which only, uh, only, only allows orange uh, values, not the red values. So that's how it's detected that this will enforce those conditions. Um, yeah, so I read the list, I check the size of the obvious thing. The only un unusual thing is the retry here. So if you've worked with STM before, you will know how the logic works. It just means that if the size hasn't changed, I, don't, I want to continue waiting. The retry means I get back to the beginning, but I will not execute it again until at least one of the variables I've read in this block has changed. So we automatically wait. How it's actually implemented behind the scenes, it could be a lock-free implementation, it could be a lock-based implementation, but the program doesn't need to know, the program just needs to you know, trust the STM semantic that this will actually wait for it safely. It will also retry when there's a conflict, but in this case it will retry explicitly because, because, uh, because it detected that it needs to wait for something to happen to these, to these shared variables before it can actually return properly. Right. If you put um, something in that bottom block that was that had side effects, so I don't know, mm -hmm. net, network I/O or something. Yeah. Um, where would where would the compile error have been? Would it be on the atomically line, the red line, or the, in the yellow? <laughs> this is the point where it's kind of curious, isn't it? Magic like yeah. deriving the. Um, yes, good, very good question. I, I was actually wanting to show that, and I forgot almost. Thank you for reminding me. So it's it's something we need to we need to look at. Um, let me just find the program and, let's, and pray that it will work. Um, the environment. So this is the, the code I was showing you. Let me just make it bigger. And let's try and do something non that violates the, the, the limitation. So let me just say, um, I'll try to bring something to the screen, OK? 
There we get an error. That's nice. What does it say? Couldn't match expected type STM with actual type IO. Right. IO is the name for the type that, of programs that allow anything. STM is the type of the program that can do only the limited. And now if you commented out line 39, the error would go away. Uh, yes, uh, pro no, it won't because it knows that the read C bar only lives in the orange uh, world, so it won't be incompatible. Right. Unfortunately, that's, it's not, it doesn't have subtyping in that sense. Yeah? Mm. We cannot say that uh, STM is a subtype of IO, therefore you can substitute. Yeah. Not in Haskell, at least. Maybe in, in Scala you can. I haven't tried STM in Scala. So instead, I have to get rid of this offending line. Uh, assuming I know how. Oh, this is not set up properly. Yet. Now it compiles. Okay. Thank you. So, is everybody comfortable with this? Uh, and hopefully, you can. Sorry. You can see that some of the some of the features of the functional programming is are helpful here. They help the safety of the thing. They force me a little bit to separate things apart, but that's what I should do anyway, right? So that's not a problem in this case. Yeah, I can't use while loops, but I can use something more fun. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Because that, that way I avoid some unnecessary state, maybe. Maybe not in this case, but yeah. quite often I, I can. All right, let's go on. Uh, just just a summary of what was good. Um, what, what I think was good in, in this example, that it wasn't shorter. Okay? In many cases, we see the functional bit being shorter than the imperative bit. In this case, because it is already imperative anyway, and we did a little bit more work, it is kind of a slightly more complicated way under, under the bonnet to, to actually achieve the synchronization. So it wasn't shorter, it was similar length, the Java and the, the kind of classical Java locks and the, the STM in Haskell. But I would argue that it was a bit more intuitive because I really hate this way to notify all, and how do I ensure that they're really great? I have to kind of look through all possible sequences of interleaving and, and check that it always does the right thing. It's composable, which means I can take this weight and I can insert it into another uh, similar block of orange stuff and combine it together without worrying about how it will, interleave. It will work. Easier to work at locks. People say so. Okay, I haven't used it on big enough examples to be sure, but I believe that. Uh, and, and we saw the type system helping well to, to actually ensure some of the important constraints that we need to adhere to for it to work correctly. Unfortunately, it's shown to be quite slow. So don't do this on something that you want to run real time or some guaranteed kind of performance. But it does scale relatively well to big system with a lot of fun threading, but it doesn't perform on a, on a very predictable and, 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 and when you actually measure like, statistics of the performance it's worse than <coughs> do it by hand uh, with blocks or with ideally without blocks that's the best way to do multithreading but it's really hard can we done lock free has anybody done lock free multithreading cool I have all the respect <laughs> okay I already said that it's available in all sorts of languages, so it doesn't mean that you have to use a functional language if you like the, the, this way of synchronizing. Do you know if the poor performance of STM is kind of inevitable given the design goals of STM, or if it's just an implementation thing that nobody's made a fast enough one yet? Mm, I don't know, to be yeah. honest. It's certainly a consequence of the way that it works, so right. it doesn't matter if it's Haskell or, or Java, you yeah. always have the same problem that sometimes you get a lot of contention and the contention is resolved not in the most efficient way. Mm -hmm. When the contention is, you don't allow either of them go. They all of them have to return and wait for a random yeah. amount of time to make it less likely they come the next time. When, when in locks system, who comes first come goes through, so there's less less of a, mm -hmm. a delay based on that. Okay. But I don't know whether you can design something completely different that's got the same compos compositionality and, and, and purity and uh, all of that. <coughs> and at the same time, is not slow. I don't know because that's very hard to kind of quantify overall such something. And I haven't seen anybody succeeding in this yet. So a summary of what was kind of a potential issue in Java, what we saw in functional languages helping. We saw unnecessary state for processing in the simple case of the list processing, but that happens all over the place in Java, I believe, whenever I work with Java, although with small systems. 
and things such as list comprehensions, being able to work with functions and values and then apply them, um, and the separation of pure type of code should alleviate this issue. Uh, yeah, we can usually get rid of most type declarations, even though it's a type language that we're working with in the functional world. Yeah, tree processing could be quite tricky in Java when we actually happy to work with trees as opposed to DAGs or, or graphs, then functional images are really, really the star. The data type, or more precisely, I should say, algebraic data types and pattern matching are the star. And, and also, if you have the immutability declarative guarantees, then that's really un unparalleled. But if you want to work with graphs, that's a completely different question. I'm not talking about that here. Uh, error prone, non composable log sequence. Okay, we get that with transactional memory. and. Uh, uh, I mean, we get the opposite, <laughs> of almost, with the transactional memory, and the ability, the ability to isolate effects, and have this special type of undoable programs, very helpful. Okay, so I'll close this chapter. Let's forget about Java, and that's not just as functional programming, but only very briefly of what it can do for us, that may be or maybe not useful in any particular situation. I have to do it fairly quickly. So the good thing is, I guess, that. These two are only one slide each. <laughs> so I really don't have you know, the time here anyway to, it will be a talk, you know, each of them will be a talk in itself if I wanted to do it properly. So I'll just give you some pointers. But this one I did a little bit more because um, that's kind of easiest to do in, in, in efficiently. Uh, has anybody heard of the term property-based testing? Yeah. Quick check. Okay. Yes, yes, quick check type of stuff. Have you used it as well? Not in production. Okay. Okay, so maybe maybe I'll help you kind of think about whether you can or can't use it in production as well. Uh, let's let's look at why this is potentially useful. <coughs> so, in, in, in your, when you when you're developing something, it, it's nice to have some specification written down. I don't know how you know with various development styles, this is more or less uh, vague or precise. But for certain things that I'm into kind of be very reusable and very um, be around for a long time maybe it's worth investing in specifying it very thoroughly and, and then one usually comes across a lot of properties in, in order that could be used kind of as a measure of, of, of quality of the design so, so I hope that you agree that these five examples are you know, something that, that, that is worth doing when you, when you work with a particular system where, where these issues where these concepts arise for example, if somebody designs an encryption algorithm and they now have these two you know, decrypt, encrypt methods, they want to be sure that they actually give you back what you, what you want uh, when you compose them. Um, and so, so, so and, and quite often we see post conditions, right? We want to validate post conditions and when we express them formally, we, we, get, we, get, we get these kind of formal properties that, that, that are actually very useful when, when, when thinking about how to write tests for these for this particular components or systems or, or libraries. Um, so property-based testing is where we not only make use of these properties, but we can automate a lot of the process of making use of these properties. Okay? Um, so let's have a look at how it works. For example, a textbook hello world example of this is the property that when the list is reversed twice, we get back to the same list. Yeah, this should always hold for well implemented reverse. Um, and the property is actually getting I have a few more bits here because I have to quantify for all lists. In this case, I enforce the integer type, but it could have been done generically as well. Uh, and now we have an object in Scala that is this property, right? So it's a, we don't really know what exactly its type is. It's called prop, but you know, what exactly is behind it, you don't really need to know. But somehow there's a function embedded in it that, given the list, says yes or no. That's the property that's encapsulated it. Then I can run a check method, and what it does, it randomly generates 100 lists, or whatever is configured to do, and the, the right number of lists, and check whether the property holds. And in this case, because it's such a simple property, I'm quite sure it's true and didn't disprove it. So that's a kind of not yes, yes, you're probably right. Um, if I'm going to be a bit more, um, but on the other hand, I'm a bit skeptical when I see this appear so quickly. I'm wondering, do they just print it anyway, you know, <laughs> to make me happy? 
<laughs> so of course we could give it a false property to see what happens. That, that's a good idea, but another way to kind of see a bit more what's happening behind the scenes. We can add this collect, um, which is a little bit impure. It's not purely functional, but but it's a it's a, it modifies the function to not only say yes or no, but it gives some other information attached to the yes or no. And this information is summarized in the output in the end. Okay? And the information here in this case is I'm collecting the size of all the lists that are coming through. And in the end I get the statistics of which sizes are most frequent and with roughly what, what frequency in, 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 in among these hundred. So I, I get that 5% of them were lists of length 2, 5 of length 3, somewhere there is 0 as well, but it's not as frequent as I expected. Well, <laughs> It, it doesn't, uh, that's, I don't know what is the distribution they use for, for generating the list, but it's not too important. But we can kind of get some feel that something is really going on this way. Now, this is where we where I try to, 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 to insert a false property. So it's about sorting. So the property says, if I get a list and I run the sort method, I get another list. And this list I'm claiming is always equal to its version where I remove duplicates. In other words, there are no duplicates. This is obviously not true is the way that this particular sort works. It doesn't remove duplicates. Um, now I want to check it. And after four pass tests, it tells me, well, this list is not true. If you, if you take this list, sort it, it will still have duplicates. Okay? So I was wrong. Uh, what I want to show here is that this list is quite short, right? How come it managed to generate a list with just two elements before it found it out? Actually, the fact is it didn't. It didn't. It was probably something with length four or five or six. But what it did behind the scenes before it reported the problem, it shortened it. So what it did, it searched for a shorter solution in a very naive way. It's got some function for every type, how to try and derive several shorter versions of any value. And for each of them, it tries whether it's still false or not. And if it's true for all the smaller ones, then it returns it as some kind of value it couldn't shrink anymore. But actually, in most cases, it, it succeeds in shrinking it, so it gives us a more useful counterexample. Now, here I ran it without the shrinking, which you can enforce, although it's not very useful. So that's part of the language? Or uh, um, check the language? What is part of the language? Sir? It's like check the method. Like the method check, check is part of the class prop. This, this, well, this, this identifier will point to a property of type prop, and each of these have the Method. You have to check. define it yourself. Or? The check, no, no. Ah, so it's, it's, it's inherited. It's the the whole the construct which okay. produces. Yeah, yeah. Reproduces it produces. Okay. Well, that's it's cool. part of the library. So, so what yeah, you see yeah. is all I have to do. Yeah, this is, yeah. You might have to write your own generators if your data ah. is more sophisticated, more sophisticated than just lists of indices or strings. Yeah. Um, so we'll get onto that. Yes. So, so the next bit before I finish <laughs> is. Uh, I can put an implication in, but it doesn't in interpret it purely logically. It insists on having sufficient number of cases where the premise is true. It doesn't allow me to to happily prove or give me a note when I when I claim that uh, if I'm on moon, then then I can fly okay? because it will never find an example where this is, the premise is true. So so here you see that if I say I only want to claim it for lists of length less than five. Most of them will not be of less length, that length, so it will re refuse to give me a knot that this, may, this is likely to be true. On the other hand, sometimes it rules out only a few and then it can be used, like in this case where I want to do it only for list of length at least two, because I need it to kind of find. I was claiming here that within, within the list, with some random index, when I look at the two neighboring elements, that index, they will be ordered correctly. Um, now here, this is where we are not happy with just using the, the, the built-in generators. So we, we need the different distribution. I mean, it for type, like we said, that is not supported yet. But we can define the generators. So for example, if I do want to really check that the double reverse equality works for small lists, I have to have a generator of small lists, which I can define, for example, as follows. So here I use the same syntax as we used earlier for list comprehensions. Okay. But it's actually not returning a list. It's instead of returning a generator which implements a certain interface allowing it to use comprehensions as well. So we 
uh, use arbitrary here, which is the ex explicit name for the default generator. Okay, so so I use arbitrary to generate me lists, and but what I return not that list, but <coughs> the list uh, concatenated as five. As you see, when I check what are the sizes now, 80% of them are like five because they would normally be longer than I chopped them. Okay. Just showing you, I'm not saying this is the best way of doing it, it's just in, in illustrating you can do things like this. Okay, and this is another example where we generate a pair of a list and already an index that's in the right range. So that makes more sense than using some tricks with modular arithmetic to get back to the ring. Um, and then we can state and uh, the, the, the sorted property is much simpler. Again, we have to rule out the last index only because then we can't have a pair. Uh, but, but that's easy to, but that will not be the case so often, so it's not a problem. Right. So that's it for quick check in Scala, Scala check. Any questions or comments about that? We've got a few minutes only left, I think. So I want to, if it's okay, I want to just very quickly <coughs> say, make a little advert for doing database programming with functional languages such as Scala and doing web programming with functional languages such as Scala. I really have, I anticipate I wouldn't have time for more than that anyway, so I'll make one slide for it. So, SQL is not bad language, or maybe I'll get stoned for saying that, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I think it's not too bad because it's quite, you know, relatively declarative. I mean, it's only imperative where it needs to be. Um, but its main problem could be that it's not typed. So it's quite easy to write a SQL that doesn't make any sense. And usually, I don't know whether your tools can help you detect that or not. Um, so I could try and impose some type system on SQL, but it's usually quite difficult. So instead, many frameworks and functional programming ones are among them have some typed equivalent of SQL that's in internally translated to SQL instead. So here's an example I just copied from the tutorial for the Slick framework, which is part of the type safe uh, family of no, no, sorry, it's, uh, it's part of the, the other one. I don't know. Sorry, I'm new to Scala. I think it's type safe. Yeah, I think it's it is type safe. Sorry, it is type safe. Sorry. So this is this is an example they give on their web page, so you can easily find it there as well, just to show that uh, instead of you can write this actually, you can still write it through SQL if you want. Uh, this is the way to do it with SQL, picking all uh, co coffees with a certain price uh, below, below a certain limit, with price below a certain limit, or you can use a comprehension instead to do that, which is obviously type checked. This is not type checked. But I guess this has got benefits. And then it's sophisticated enough to deal with joins and, and all the bits that you want in, 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 a, in, a, in a SQL and then the relational databases. That's obviously mapping, object relational mapping for you as well for free. It's quite nice. Um, there are others than, than this, this one. And similarly in web programming, this is obviously a lot more complicated than just, just for, for relation database processing. I just want to highlight the fact that there are fairly well-developed frameworks for doing functional uh, web programming. These are the ones I'm aware of in Scala and Haskell world. Um, and how do they help? Well, they give us DSLs. Of course, those are often useful when doing that kind of enterprise level web development. But these are all type safe because they're in a type function language. And thanks to all these features, it's quite easy to, 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 to do that. And then it's fairly, fairly helpful in checking quite a lot of properties for free. Quite often, we can get uh, you know, quite far away from HTTP thanks to these frameworks. Um, and moreover, in the Lyft framework, I think that's the most advanced of them all in terms of abstraction uh, of these that I mentioned. I mean, in terms of that, it, it, it even hides <coughs> the request response nature, so you don't have to work in MVC. You can actually just define the application from the user's endpoint of view. Still need to tell what kind of Ajax or what kind of comment, what, what's going on, uh, how it's going to co communicate between the front and back end, but you don't have to worry about URLs, you don't have to worry about uh, Kind of following the, the traditional patterns, you can focus more on the, um, on, the, on, the, on, the on what's what's in the view as opposed to what's in the model and what's in the um, controller. There's no single controller for the whole page, for example. And this is an example of something I've done. So, so I did a little application in, in this, one of the Haskell frameworks where it was just uh, you know nothing fancy. <laughs>